Hi, and welcome to the final video here in the matter unit. It is also the final video here in our discussion of cells and how they're organized. In this video, we're going to talk about eukaryotic cellular systems, the kinds of things that we see at work inside of eukaryotic cells. And this is not a picture of a eukaryotic cell. This is a picture of a detector in the Large Hadron Collider, which is the largest particle accelerator on the planet. It is in Europe and spans the border between Switzerland and France. I, I'm, I'm putting it up here as an example of one of the most complex machines that we have ever made, just to make the point that even though this is one of the most complex machines that humans have ever created with millions of different components all functioning together, it has nothing on a cell. Cells are much more complex than even the Large Hadron Collider containing billions, if not tens of billions of individual components all functioning together in ways that we certainly do not fully understand. In this video, we're going to try to answer the question of how do eukaryotic cells function? Plant-like eukaryotes and animal-like eukaryotes, how do they work? So we're going to talk about a system called the endomembrane system as an example of one of the major ways that eukaryotic cells process information and matter. We're going to look at eukaryotic energy processing systems, mitochondria and chloroplasts, We'll talk a little bit about plant-like versus animal-like cells to round it all out. So let's begin with the endomembrane system. The organelles that we're going to focus on in the endomembrane system are here. We'll talk about each one in turn. And this is really the direction in which membrane and proteins flow inside of any eukaryotic cell. So we'll go and talk about each one in turn, and we'll start with the nucleus. The nucleus is the organelle that stores DNA. Inside of the nucleus, the DNA is kept as uncoiled chromatin, and you can see that represented in the image here. The nuclear membrane allows for the transport of nucleotides, RNA, other, other materials that are required in and out. There are a series of pore complexes that span throughout the entirety of the nuclear membrane and allow for that transport to occur. The nucleus also has a structure called the nucleolus. We won't talk too much about that, but we'll just spotlight it real quick. This is a region of DNA that's specifically involved in producing ribosomal RNA subunits, but so acknowledged, we're gonna kinda leave it there. This is a fluorescence micrograph of the nucleus, and we can see the nuclear membrane being shown here with the nuclear pore proteins stained in red, the nuclear membrane stained in green, and the chromatin is stained blue. Moving on in our endomembrane system, we're going to move to the next structure, which is the endoplasmic reticulum, which is itself broken into the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And these terms refer to their appearance. The rough endoplasmic reticulum looks rough because it's covered in ribosomes that are attached to it. These ribosomes are what are called bound ribosomes, and they're making any proteins that are either going to be inserted into membrane or going to be secreted from the cell. This is different from free ribosomes, which are floating around in the cytoplasm, making proteins that are going to remain in the cytoplasm. Moving from the rough endoplasmic reticulum, there's a transition to the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, which does not have bound ribosomes on its surface. The smooth endoplasmic reticulum is really the organelle that makes all the membrane that's going to be used by the cell. It also has some functions to play with storage and the detoxification of certain compounds. We're not going to worry too much about that. This is a transmission electron micrograph of endoplasmic reticulum. The nucleus is the large speckled blob down at the bottom right in this diagram. And the endoplasmic reticulum is all of the channels of membrane that basically fill up most of the area of this image. It is all endoplasmic reticulum, which is an incredibly important organelle given the role that it plays in the endomembrane system. The nuclear membrane is actually contiguous with the endoplasmic reticulum. They're connected to each other inside of the cell. But to move from the endoplasmic reticulum to the next organelle in the process, the Golgi apparatus, substances are going to need to travel through what we call vesicles. Vesicles are simply compartments of membrane that bud off from the endoplasmic reticulum and then move throughout the cell, fusing with other structures. In this case, they're going to fuse at the next organelle in the system, the Golgi apparatus. In this scanning electron micrograph, you can see a vesicle down at the bottom right with a V in it. The V stands for vesicle. Let's move on and talk about the Golgi apparatus. This is a diagram of the Golgi apparatus. You can see the incoming vesicles up at the top. They will then fuse with the flattened membrane components of the Golgi apparatus, and material will move from one compartment to the next 
by traveling through vesicles until finally reaching the end and leaving by outgoing vesicles. The Golgi apparatus really serves as a place to modify proteins into their functional final versions. The protein isn't just that polypeptide chain or collection of polypeptide chains. A lot of times other substances need to be added to that protein or the protein needs to be chemically modified in certain ways. This is what happens at the Golgi apparatus before the final version of that protein is dispatched to wherever it needs to go inside of the cell. Here in this electron micrograph, you can see the Golgi apparatus down at the bottom, kind of towards the left, as that series of flattened membranous compartments. And you can see a series of vesicles that are all surrounding the Golgi apparatus, many of which are probably either in the process of going to the Golgi apparatus or leaving from the Golgi apparatus. From the Golgi apparatus, vesicles and any of the proteins that may be inside of them can go to a variety of different locations. They may wind up going to the cell membrane, like you see in this image here, or they could go to any of the other membrane-bound organelles inside of the cell. We're going to spotlight one of these organelles, which are the lysosomes. Lysosomes are essentially vesicles that are filled with digestive enzymes. And when a vesicle containing molecules fuses with the lysosome, the enzymes in that lysosome will begin to break apart and hydrolyze the large molecules that are inside of that vesicle. You can think about a lysosome as accomplishing the intracellular per process of digestion, breaking down large molecules into smaller ones. Here in this image, you can see a lysosome over on the left-hand side. I've circled it for you, and it's stained black because the enzymes that are inside of it are simply causing it to resolve as a blackish color in this electron micrograph. Moving now from the endomembrane system into energy processing in eukaryotes, energy processing is the domain of mitochondria and chloroplasts. Mitochondria, which you can see over on the left, is where aerobic cellular respiration occurs in eukaryotic cells, and chloroplasts are where photosynthesis occurs in eukaryotic cells. Both mitochondria and chloroplasts have remnants of their endosymbiotic origin, which we talked about in our evolutionary unit. The fact that they were at one time free living prokaryotes that were engulfed or swallowed by other prokaryotic cells and have over time evolved into these organelles. They both have prokaryotically structured DNA, so they have one chromosome that's circular in its structure, and they have their own ribosomes that are more similar to prokaryotic ribosomes in terms of the size of the subunits than they are to the eukaryotic ribosomes in their host cells. They both reproduce independently of the cell, so their, their reproduction is not tied to cell division or cellular reproduction. And they both have highly folded inner membranes, which you can see here on these transmission electron micrographs of both of them, which are essentially surface area adaptations to maximize the amount of aerobic cellular respiration and photosynthesis that they can accomplish. As we wrap up here in terms of our eukaryotic cells, let's talk briefly about plant-like versus animal-like eukaryotes and how we can tell the differences between them. You can see probably the visual differences that are most obvious, uh, particularly in terms of the structure, the overall shape of the plant-like and animal-like eukaryotic cells. Obviously, plant-like eukaryotic cells have a cell wall, which is made out of cellulose, which is why they have this boxy structure. Animal-like cells do not have a cell wall. Plant-like cells have a large central vacuole, which you can see in this image right next to the plant-like cell's nucleus. Animal-like cells do have vacuoles, but they have small vacuoles instead of this large internal central vacuole. And of course, plant-like cells have chloroplasts and mitochondria both, since they carry out both photosynthesis and aerobic cellular respiration, whereas animal-like cells only have mitochondria because they only carry out aerobic cellular respiration. As we wrap up, I just want to talk about one last misconception, which I think is probably the biggest one when thinking about cells, and that's the notion that cells are not people. It's really easy to ascribe human-like emotions to cellular systems, but cells are not conscious, right? Cells are not planning things. They don't want things. They have no conscious desires. It's easy to analogize the functions of organelles inside of a cell to all sorts of objects that we see in human society. And so we might see things like, since the mitochondria carries out aerobic cellular respiration, sometimes people call it the powerhouse of the cell, for instance. It's definitely something that you need to avoid in this course when you're talking about these things in a formal setting. It's really easy and common to do this in an informal setting, and I think we all do it all of the time. It, that's fine. But in a formal setting, particularly in quizzes and exams, and certainly on the AP exam, you need to avoid that entirely. The cell is, does not want to do something. It is not planning to do something. And similarly, the structures inside of cells are 
analogous only by rough estimates to any sort of structures that we see in human society at large. So that wraps up our discussion of eukaryotic cellular systems and it wraps up our matter unit. Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you can do the following things here at the end. Make sure you can recognize the major cellular structures that are found in eukaryotic cells, describe those structures and explain their functions. Also make sure that you can describe the endomembrane system and how every organelle in the system contributes to it. Make sure that you can describe the features of mitochondria and chloroplasts that demonstrate their endosymbiosis and how they function in energy processing. A lot more about that next unit. And finally, make sure you can compare and contrast plant-like and animal-like eukaryotic cells. If you can do all those things, you're doing great. If not, that's okay too. Take a moment and write down any questions that you have so that you can get the answers that you need. Thanks again for watching. I really appreciate it. Have a great day.